Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, this is a conversation between, um, this will be a conversation between Dr. Jasmine Nicole Cobb and the Deborah Willis. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Art, Art History and Visual Studies, and the Center for Documentary Studies. And we also want to thank all of those who came out to the master class earlier. Um, and um, I want to say that I have the distinct honor of introducing a woman who I think doesn't really need to be introduced because her pioneering work speaks for her. Uh, but I will, without further ado, I will introduce her. Um, Deborah Willis is university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts and Sciences at New, uh, New York University and has an affiliated appointment with the College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, Africana Studies, where she teaches courses on photography and imaging, uh, iconicity and cultural uh, visual culture, the, the photographic history of slavery and emancipation, contemporary women photographers, and beauty. She received the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship and a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. Willis is the author of uh, Posing Beauty, African American Images from the 1890s to the Present, and co-author of The Black Female Body, A Photographic History, Envisioning Emancipation, Black Americans, and the End of Slavery and Michelle Obama, The First Lady in Photographs, um, both titles an NAACP Image Award winner. Professor Willis's curated exhibitions include In Pursuit of Beauty at Express Newark, Let Your Motto Be Resistance, African American Portraits at the International Center of Photography, and Reframing Beauty, Intimate Moments at Indiana University. Since 2006, she has co-organized thematic conferences exploring imaging the black body in the West, such as the conference titled Black Portrait Portraitures, which was held in Johannesburg in 2016. She has appeared and consulted on me media projects, including documentary films such as Through a Lens Darkly and Question Bridge, Black Males, a Transmedia Project, which received the ICP Infinity Award 2015 and uh, American Photography PBS documentary. She will be joined in conversation by Jasmine, Dr. Jasmine Nicole Cobb, who is the Baca Foundation Associate Professor of Art, Art History and Visual Studies in African and African American Studies and the co-director of the From Slavery to Freedom Lab. Dr. Cobb is the author of Picture Freedom, Remaking Black Visuality in the Early 19th Century. And we have the distinct honor of having Dr. Deborah, Will, Dr. Deborah Willis, who is a visionary a pioneer and she, who dares us to think uh, anew about images, black life, history, past and present. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. So before we begin, I'd just like to say thank you to Jennifer for organizing. Uh, and also thank you to the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies, as well as the Center for Documentary Studies for co-sponsoring uh, our guests today and thank you so much to Deb Willis for joining us from afar. So many things I wanna ask you and just hear about your work um, over the years and now. Um, I'll go through many questions, but I guess I'm curious first about how you got your start in sort of the scholarly engagement with visual culture. Um, yeah. Well, I wanna say thank you, first of all, Jasmine, Mamad, and Oh, my friends at the center, um, because this is just amazing. I had not realized until you contacted me that it's 25 years since Picturing Us, which I had no idea that it just, just seems like yesterday. I remember it so well. But I, I started, I think, as a, as a kid growing up, living in a house full of photographs and, and having that experience. But, you know, Rick Powell, I'm, I'm so glad to see Rick and CT here because Rick and I basically started our careers at the same time as students and then researching and interested in, in telling stories through, through the arts. And I remember you, we were sitting together at Schomburg and laughing and discovering at the same time. And I had not met anyone as excited about research than Rick Powell. And, and as, as I am, it had the same kind of passion and, and to have that 
community was was really important for me. Mm-hmm. So I was working at Schomburg then. I had just finished grad school at uh, Pratt and mm-hmm. and had begun the research. But I started the research as an undergraduate at the Philadelphia College of Art, which is now the University of the Arts. And um, I uh, did not have any uh, black photographers in my history books and there was, and I knew based on growing up in a beauty shop in my mother's house that there was Gordon Parks, there was Roy Tigarava, you know, and then there was my father's cousin who had a studio down the street and a, and a, and a black photojournalist, um, Jack Franklin, who photographed during the uh, civil rights movement um, and very active in Philadelphia. So I knew that their stories were somewhere and their right. photographs were somewhere. So I thought it was really um, important for me to think about how to how to plan my career when I was young. Sure. Mm-hmm. So you were in the presence of images at home and then also in the presence of image mm-hmm. makers, mm-hmm. people taking pictures, right. and then in the presence of peers also interested in black images mm-hmm. in the same sort of a way. Um, the family piece seems to come up a lot in your work. Mm -hmm. And you've shared some family images here with us today. Family is central in terms of of coming up with ideas and supporting them and making them happen. And I had a dream and I I love Paris. I've loved Paris since I was, you know, I can remember seeing Can Can and movies when I was a preteen. And I love the stories of Paris and then I, wanted to organize an exhibition in Paris as well as as a conference. And in 2013, Mancha Diawara and I um, came up with a plan to visit, and Hank was living in Paris at the time. Mm-hmm. And we went to the to Kay Brenly and to um, so the Beaux-Arts to see if we could organize a conference. And Cheryl was there at the time. And so we decided to, to make it happen. And they was wonderful about it that people liked the idea and we talked about why it was important to show photographs to think about the idea of the black portrait but look at the collective portraitures of black people in in the diaspora um it was the most amazing conference that i had organized internationally first time but the voices of the people who attended they were really excited um and then the people who were there said you know, how come you can come here and organize a conference? Because there was some anger as well, because they can't enter in some of these museums or can't get uh, a place. And so how could you come here and do this? And we can't do this. And then we talked about having access and space and uncomfortable moments, but everyone actually came together um, in in that way. So this is why I, I love this image, because it's thinking about having Hank and, and, and Cheryl as my anchors in this. But um, Hank, um, so my father died in 1990, too young at, at the age of 68. Mm-hmm. And um, we and we, we were a close, close family for my mother had 13 brothers and sisters. My father had 10 brothers and sisters. So I had 50 first cousins growing up. So it was all of us all the time. And um, one, so Hank was, Hank loved going to my mother's house looking at images and, and flipping through photographs. And then he noticed that we, he found a photograph. Um, someone had given me a photograph holding Hank I had not seen in a while. Mm-hmm. And a friend had given me that photograph. And then Hank found a photograph of um, my mother holding me. And he says, look at you both kind of holding and don't know. He told me I didn't know how to hold him. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I said, so we realized that both my mother and I were mothers at 27. And so this is a piece called Mothers at 27 that um, we created. And going through the photographs and, and, and thinking about family, we thought the narrative of our, our family, we, we had fun. We did everything. We didn't need, quote, friendships outside, sure. but we had extended friends as family, as my mother uh, sisters and all of them had a lot of extended cousins and friends Mm -hmm. so this is a portrait of me with my father in the studio of my father's um cousin and and then and then this this is the one that really excited me because we 
had just looking at my mother, looking at me, um, so adoringly, you know, that it just really, I saw that image, I said, well, you know, mom, this is just so moving for me to see that. And I had no idea what that meant to her. Sure. But also we had a babysitter and we're at the table. And so we're in the kitchen and, and having those moments. So my father loved the everyday aspect of taking photographs. He photographed us in, in, in many, on many occasions and also sent photographs when he, in, when he was in the war to my mother um, when they were married. So um, he, as, as a family, as I mentioned to Jasmine earlier, my father, after the war, he went to a school called the Berean Institute, which for, was for black um, GIs after war or black people specifically, but he had a, a grant there to study. So he was a tailor, he was, um, he was a policeman, he went to the police force, but he also had a grocery store and he was a paper hanger, so he did everything. And he was to everything to everybody and he helped his brothers and sisters move from Orange County, Virginia to Philly. So we were like the first house that the family lived in. On that right, on that migration of, mm -hmm. you know, and then of course they lived in bigger houses mm -hmm. after we left. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my father, um, this is a Christmas photo moment, and my father was set, um, basically using us as a prop for his, um, as a showing his paper hanging skills, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so he made calendar images um, and, and had these, these images. And what I found fascinating always of me with the black doll and my sister with the white doll and how that became a central way of how did, how did I know to identify with um, ethnic specific toys and yeah. with that framing. Yeah. So that's how, I mean, in terms of family. Mm -hmm. He, in terms of family also, because of dad, he always loved history and we would visit historical sites often. And it's just kind of a, a really fascinating image with cousins and all of us. And I'm here in, in Gettysburg with the cannon, <laughs> you know? You know, like, what am I doing in this finger in the cannon? And he's, huh? Fight, claim, claiming my freedom, right? <laughs> okay, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and these are just some of the images. And this is one of the first photographs that I had made with a brownie that my father had given um, at Christmas. And, and so we can see all of the gifts and the TV and the cards and, and all of that. So family was a central family. part of this. Yeah, is a reoccurring theme. And in mm -hmm. a way, it, it sort of gives us a window into um, sort of theories of visual, theories of the visual that circulate in Black families about mm -hmm. color and complexion and presentation and style and all of these things, such mm -hmm. as with the doll. Mm -hmm. um, a, another picture that you share uh, in picturing us, uh, I believe, is... Um, or a story about the hair salon. You, mm -hmm. you begin with um, the mm -hmm. hair salon, and then you share. So, so this is one that that's central. I, my mother went to Apex Beauty School. Mm -hmm. So when we think about, of course, there's the wallpaper again, mm -hmm. you know. But to think about that, not only art was photographs were on the wall. There was my mother's her her diploma from the Apex Beauty School. Mm -hmm. So that sense of pride um, yeah. was was always in our faces and mm -hmm. central. But I'm on the phone. My father used to, because we only had one phone and you had to listen, everyone could listen to you talk on the phone. You can't, huh? You, party line, yeah, but you couldn't, you couldn't sneak upstairs and talk to anyone. But I was always on the telephone. My father said that, you know, like, you're always on the phone. So he took a photograph of me. I'm not, no, I'm never on the phone. And then I, we found this reason. I had not realized he had taken a photograph of me on the phone, I'm in it too, whatever, whatever I'm talking about. And, you know, I'm like 12 or 13, but I'm having a ball, you know, with um, talking to my cousin probably. Yeah. But um, here's mom in one of her friends. My mother is 97 and is really fantastic and she's healthy and good. Um, but here she is, um, a number of her friends were, this was in 1999 when I photographed her and one of her friends. 
And growing up in, in her beauty shop, there were a lot of rules, but there was also a lot of listening to stories. And, and I love, you know, listening to women and about relationships, but I didn't know what they were talking about, but they all were supporting each other mm -hmm. uh, and, and that aspect. Of, but this one is my favorite. Uh, her name is Miss McGee. In her shop, she has rules like three minutes, you know, like you can talk for three minutes on the phone. You know, the children couldn't run around. You had to sit. Um, there were rules in terms of how to behave in a beauty shop. And and Miss McGee was like no nonsense, and she had all of that. So I always love going to see her and, and photograph her and having that opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. how, the, how to present in public, mm -hmm. right, which is some of the work of the photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just as you had image makers and images around and it permeated your work so mm -hmm. too did hank have images and image makers mm -hmm. around that seemed to have permeated his work yeah when he was young i don't know we we, we we're still trying to uncover that moment when because he both basically did the same thing i did mm -hmm. with with my father when the photographs came back from the five and dime shop or the drug shop drugstore, I would place the photographs in the album or take them out of the car just to look at them mm -hmm. out of the package. When he was little, three and four, he would always go into the family album and rearrange them. You know, um, he could not understand the black and white photograph and when did color, he was asking my mother, well, who's this? And my mother would say, would you stop asking questions, you know? <laughs> And leave the photographs alone. And she had, she used to hide the albums when he, but he was curious about those images. And I mean, he looked closely at images. And this is a piece that he created. Um, sometimes I, sometimes I see myself in you. And it was the most amazing moment. I'm deep in doing some other, other work. And he was visiting and he said, Mom, come look at this. And I looked and I'm like, wow, that's, that's odd. I said, why are you? And then I realized he had put our faces together and that was weird. <laughs> but it's I thought it was more so rearranging, right? <laughs> right? To what he was doing. Yeah, it's, um, it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah. he saw something mm -hmm. that I had not realized how much we look alike because I see people say to me, oh, you're Hank's mom. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, we were in, in, in Italy at the Biennale a few years ago, and I said, 10 people said to me, you're Hank's mom. And I decided to start taking pictures of people who said that mm -hmm. with that aspect of it. And he says when he was little, he was, you know, you're Deb's son. Yeah. So it's like in terms of that reverse. Mm -hmm. But it, it started also with this image here where he is also going through and now he will feel like my mother. He's going through my things. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. he found a contact sheet that was cut off um, of these three images. Of mm -hmm. It was black and white. And we were invited by Alan Edmonds uh, with Brandywine Workshop to create a piece. And I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, and then he said, well, let's look at some images. And he found this image. And I was moved by it, but I also remember that um, I had a teacher who said that I was taking up a good man's space when I was in school. He said, all you're going to do is get pregnant, have a child, and a good man could have been in that seat. And there were like 18 guys in the classroom wow. and three Eight women. And okay. <laughs> it was three <laughs> women in the classroom. And what I realized, he was, he, shut, he was trying to shame me for being a woman, mm -hmm. shut me down for my dream of wanting to be a photographer and an artist. But I um, came true. I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't oh, believe wow, that I let this man, you know, take away my natural lifestyle of being a woman and having that opportunity to be to mature and have this concept of being a mother. But I didn't want to go back to Philadelphia because they're going to see me and I'm pregnant and I'm not going to be an artist and, and this is going to happen and exactly. And then I said, what? I had to recognize that right. I was falling right into a trap of being somebody's othered right. um, stereotyped. And, but it took me just like 
you know, like three or four weeks, uh, you know, months, not months, but like six weeks when I began to show, when I realized that, you know, like Philly is my home. I'm not going to let this professor stop me from walking down the street, you know, pregnant and, and happy about being pregnant. But I had, um, but, you know, so I, anyway, I made these images. It was fun to make the image, but I had forgotten about it. And so I created this piece that says, a woman taking a space from a good man, and then the accusation, you took a space from a good man. And then I made a space from a good man. So I flipped the, yes. the image by saying I, I made a space for a good man. And that really kind of transformed it. You can't imagine how many women and husbands have said to me, thank you for making that piece. My wife stopped making work because a professor said the same thing to her. Um, I met a woman who was in her 70s, mm -hmm. and she said that she didn't start making art until she was 65 because a professor said that to her. Wow. And um, when her children were out of school and then her grandchildren were were far away, she decided to start making art again. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it affected um, that kind of, you know, um, language, um, which I can't even coin what it is and phrase what it is but it misogyny. yeah it is misogyny but there's mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. because it's just it it goes throughout the it permeates in terms of the the whole experience of, of women artists mm -hmm. that i meet and and having that uh, that it's moment a reoccurring it's a theme. reoccurring theme mm -hmm. you know for mm -hmm. so many people and then husbands who've said I, you know i'm just so glad you said that i wish my wife was here you know it really gets at what i saw um, even before reading this piece is a, an activist element to your work, mm -hmm. um, both through art, art making um, or art practice, but then also the research of black images. This was striking. I don't know if everyone's able to read what's on here, but this is a, a letter that you wrote um, to a library. No, it was to my, my thesis, my, my, my teacher. She was chair of the department. Her name was Barbara Blondo, unfortunately, she died th the year after um, I sent this to her. I wanted an independent study mm -hmm. um, to create this. And so I wrote, I, it's just amazing in terms of independent research projects, 1973. Um, and I was determined to find a work. In a, a, and I write, I have found no standard art history that refers to any Afro-American artists. And then I'm planning to collect biographies, photographs, and any written material. What makes a photographer? What motivates him? You know, him, him, him. Mm -hmm. uh, could these photo photographers receive the same recognition their white colleagues receive? And I made a list, and and these are the list. And I decided um, uh, Monita Sleet Jr., uh, Gordon Parks, and Roy DiCarava, and um, Robert Scurlock were the four photographers that I met in, in James Van Der Zee, um, during that time period. And it was really important for me that Gordon Parks was the first person who responded to my, wow. my little undergraduate letter. <laughs> you know? Yeah, <laughs> and he crazy. said, yes, Debbie, come and see me. <laughs> you know? And it was, it was so sweet to have Gordon Parks respect this undergraduate student and um, and to mentor me, and I visited his, his house at UN Plaza, and he opened up the door, and we were friends until he died, and That's and he stayed in touch. Story. Monita Sleet Jr. also um, felt the same way. Um, you know, we he was an Aquarian, born on Valentine's Day, and and just a sweetheart of a man, and he was Ebony, and I read and looked at his photographs in Ebony most of my life. And so he allowed me in, and as a result of that, I, um, you know, created this project for my class, and it was really fantastic to have that moment. What this uh, image helped me appreciate even more, uh, separate from your body of work, is how much you had to create an archive, even as you were critiquing the archive. Mm. Um, this really put into perspective for me how much you didn't walk into an archive that people already understood as formed mm -hmm. and in existence. And, so. and it's, it's fascinating to hear that because I was at, at Temple University then 
in the library then um, on the floors because they were open stacks. Mm -hmm. And I would just op open up um, black press um, newspapers and, and look for photographers, look for city directories that listed black photographers that had an asterisk if they were colored. Mm -hmm. And so I had, that's how I created the list. It was by going, by going, going page by page by page. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And the first, you know, when I was, you know, a kid, of course, Sweet Fly Paper of Life, and Roy DiCarava was um, supportive. We talked, and but he said I could never write about his photographs, but any project that I was involved with, he would let, allow me to publish one of his images. Oh, that's interesting. Right. <laughs> Do you know what that distinction was about for him? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know, but yeah. I didn't push it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't push it. Yeah. <laughs> and then what I loved about Roy's work is is what I I loved Harlan when I was a kid growing up and I loved the images that he created but I loved the light um, that he was able yes. to um, to work with in, in making images yes. and, and this is a, a young uninformed mind looking at, at photographs yeah. and that's what I felt and as a result of the that first project and, and I went to grad school at Pratt and you know, um, leaving Pratt in 1979, I happened to walk down a hallway that I've never walked down ever in that in my two years at Pratt, and I happened to see on the wall that there was a job at the Schomburg Center, which I used to do my research for a photo specialist, wow. and I'm like, that's my job. Yeah. So, yeah. and I and I walked. I called right away because there were two. I had two job offers: one to teach at Bucks County Community College, mm -hmm. which was eleven thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and the other job was to no twelve thousand dollars. And the job at Schomburg was ten eight, you know, ten thousand eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And I I I applied for the job. I met Mrs. Uh, Jean Blackwell Hudson, who was a library, but also met um, Ruth Ann Stewart, who said, you know, well, we need to hire you. And, you know, I love the fact that I was working at the Schomburg and I had librarians who knew all of the people I loved, like Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and all the people I read. And having that opportunity, I was allowed to into create the archive. And they had an archive that was just images it was a to z mm -hmm. and i knew the names of the photographers and um, there was a man by the name of richard newman who is i call him my angel he called me up in 1982 he said how would you like to do a book on black photographers and i said well i have a i have a paper in undergraduate language on mm -hmm. a black on black photographers and he said well let me see it and he said, okay, let's do this book. And we created this book here, uh, Black Photographers, a Biobibliography. And it listed over um, 300 photographers and I created yeah. the bi bio within that and then wrote to different libraries trying to find images. And um, then I had, um, and it was, it was amazing because that book meant a lot to me and it was $85. And I said to the publisher of Garland Publishing, I said, well, I want a book that my grandmother could buy. He said, this book is not for your grandmother. So I'm like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I you know, was determined to try to figure out a way to have access so that my grandmother and other grandmothers could have the book. Sure. And then um, Dick came again and said, we can let's do 1940 to 1988. And we follow did this, a, a follow-up book mm -hmm. where I could and bring the contemporary photographers in, which was mm -hmm. massive, over over the top for me, and had a chance to, this is Jack Franklin's photograph, who was in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. who had been basically overlooked in Philadelphia, and his work, this is at the March on Washington in 1963. So what I found in doing that research, where there were a number of overlooked photographers who, some threw their archives out, because no one cared, and mm -hmm. And they were really happy to share share these moments. So these are some of the projects I met, you know, Vanderzee, mm -hmm. and um, and then this other. Let's see this one. 
JP Ball was the one that I was really excited about because he was an abolitionist. He was born in Virginia and moved to Cincinnati and Montana and, and Seattle and just kind of documented the black people as abolitionists, as people who migrated west. But he also photographed um, you know, white abolitionists and white families in, in Cincinnati. Um, it was really exciting to, to, to discover his work. And Garland published that, and these are some of the images from 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 that, from you know having images of of Masonic um, masons in this small town to a young woman who is possibly a an um, an education or graduation image mm -hmm. because of the scroll. Some of these signifiers are used uh -huh. as if they are education or someone who graduated. Mm -hmm. They use this kind of um, motif within it, but. Also, we see the whole cross-cultural aspect of it, where the Asian-style top and a number of Chinese uh, men who and women moved there because of the railroad, building the railroad um, during that time. So we can imagine the community that was developed based on dress and hairstyle and see her hairstyle. Yes, I do. <laughs> right. And then um, there was a uh, publisher, The New Press, um, David, I uh, can't think of his last name, uh, but he left the pub. He left. He called me up and said, I'd like for you to do a book on um, just invite people, any book that you'd like to do and what would you like to consider? And I said, you know what, I'd like to do a book. All of the people that I like and I meet uh, who are not photographers to write about how photographers, how photographs affected their lives. And so we created Picturing Us. And this is Verda Mae Grosvenor's um, grandmother, um, this wow. image here. And Verda Mae um, lived in Philadelphia at the time. And I used to love riding the train with her. And she had great stories to tell. And she said, isn't it funny how Philadelphia has these uh, funny food ways? Like, who eats chicken wings and um, turkey wings? You know, like, I don't know. Do you have turkey wings in, in your area? Yeah. But no, but Philadelphia, you don't have turkey wings in New York, you know, but, <laughs> right? But in New York, and we talked about how, and so she talked about what what I loved about Verna May. She said that that um, a shoebox was her museum in terms of photographs, oh, and that okay. and you know that's there were stories they told stories so they didn't have photographs. Mm -hmm. And then um, Claudine Brown um, decided to uh, write about a, um, a, a um, convict image, a wanted um, what's it, a mugshot image. Mm -hmm. and, and here, and all his crime was he's, he was a suspicious character. And so um, using that, and this, this was the hard, and this was the soft cover. And so there were different people that I uh, had a chance to, to meet. Um, and just love that moment. Bell Hooks talked about a photograph of her, her, of her dad. Yeah, you opened mm -hmm. picturing us with this, the hair piece, so personal style, but also context, how many other people were mm -hmm. also thinking about images simultaneous to mm -hmm. you. Um, and even though works come before this, what I loved about picturing us, thinking about it um, 25 years later, is that it's, both forward looking and retrospective. Um, there's a way in which almost every image in your introduction there ends up getting its own book, right? Mm. You end up talking about the black female body. You talk more about um, hot and tot as an image. You talk about um, representations of uh, black people sort of on the edge of freedom and slavery. Uh, and so, you know, thinking about that, I wanted to hear more about how you see it in the body of your work, because it's kind of a roadmap, I think, mm. for where the field goes from this point. Um, but I was curious about its relationship to your other scholarship as you see it. Well, in terms of picturing us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was. It was the outline for me, yeah. you know, um, and I like the idea of the roadmap because I think that that was the beginning for me to think about how I could move forward in images from images of writing about dolls 
to think about writing about family history, memory. Mm -hmm. um, one aspect of it, I grew up in a family of quilters mm -hmm. and um, they weren't the neat kind of quilters where mm -hmm. everything was shaped and mm -hmm. cut and, and geographically and, and geomet geometrically um, clear. They, they used their quilts, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. they weren't hanging on the wall. But when my dad died, um, we used to give my father you know, ties for birthdays, for Christmas, for every Father's Day. And, you know, he wore them sometimes too long because mm -hmm. he had this, we used to call them the double-breasted chest cover ties. And, Daddy, you can't wear that, <laughs> you know, and to the point where he saved them. And um, so we, when he died, we, I just wanted to make a, a daddy's ties. A piece is called Daddy's Ties. Yeah. And um, to look at him, like I didn't know him when he was on the beaches of Atlantic City, you know, hanging out with my mom and sisters or when he was in the war. But he was also, um, he sang in a, in a choral group. And here, and he also acted and so here are things that he won medals for. And so I wanted to kind of create a daddy's ties to, um, to his community and to his activism um, because he really cared a lot about people. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know death in terms of how do we deal with death and, and grieving. So for eight years, I did work about my father in different ways. Oh, and one day I was in Arizona and I was talking about this piece in the Arizona. They purchased this piece in their collection. And then I heard my father say, enough already. <laughs> you know what I mean? He just hit me on my shoulder. And I happened to look in this darkened audience, and everybody was like, you know, looking at me like that. And I said, you know what? Daddy just said enough already. And they just like... I mean, it was an air of sigh. Oh, People, they, they exhale. It was yeah. a collective sigh. It's like, oh, my God, I had not realized that I was grieving as long as I had gr grieved for my, over my father's death. Sure. And then it, was, th then it opened up a whole um, area of, of new work. So I had a chance to look at community and, and think about reflections in black. Um, wanted to look at um, images of... And this is Arthur Badeau. This is his photograph of um, in New Orleans. But we know that um, Booker T. Washington h hired him to photograph his Southern tour. And so we see this camera in the center. And I remember the difficulties I had in terms of um, image covers and, and you know, designers and editors are thinking of what's the best image and how to tell the story. And some people felt that there were too many people, black people on the cover of this oh, book. Uh, what's the wow. name of this book? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So, um, so there was like a survey going over, what do you think about this image? And then, you know, some people liked it, some people didn't, but, but I'm glad we won out with that one. Yeah. And then I met Carla Williams, um, her grad in grad school and her professor, um, um, Tom Barrow called me up and said, you know, Deb, I have a student in my classes and photographing her behind. How do I deal with this? How do I critique this? What do I talk about with this? And um, I just don't know what to say. And he said, so I want to, I want you to meet her. And Carla and I met and she was referencing, you know, how um, being objectified in different ways as because of body types and, and looking at the image of Sarah Bartman. And Carla and I connected right away and thought we should do a book together um, on, on the black female body historically through photographs. And Carla is a fantastic writer and researcher. And yes. she looked at the French images and, and, and we looked at the, and I looked at the American and we decided to, to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And then other projects happened along the way um, of looking at Harlem and um, and then someone put me in this book, which I found fascinating, Photography Visionaries, and it was just, and I found out purely by accident. Then um, I met Barbara Krauthammer when she was teaching at NYU, and we had a, um, we, we used to see each other at dinners and at events, and she knew that we were both interested in history, and she said, you know, I really would love to do a project with you and, and just kind of look at images together. And we had that 
great um, energy to find in a way. And then she moved off to teach at the University of Mass. Mm -hmm. But we still stay connected. And then we um, created this this project. Carrie Mae Weems, uh, of course, is, has been a friend since 1977. Um, she was co organizing an exhibition at the Brockman Gallery in L.A. on women photographers before Internet, before anything. And she sent me a letter and invited me to be a part of it. And, and so Carrie has, um, she asked me to write for her Hampton project. And then this was at the Studio Museum. And um, Mary Schmidt Campbell asked a number of us to write essays. And, and Rick, you're part of this, too. Um, and it was really exciting to to look at um, Harlem photographers uh, during that, that time period. So these were the moments of of how do we think about um, finding new archives? And and this was the best find for me was Charles White's photographs. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It was amazing. Um, I know his son, and he we were at CAA. You know, as I say, when I mm -hmm. travel, that's when I can get research mm -hmm. done. And he said. You know, I have a stack of three ring binders of my father's photographs. I'd love for you to look at them. And we're in the hotel in the restaurant and he has these stacked. I'm flipping through and his photographs are just amazing. And I said, Wow, we need to do something with this. And then, you know, we did nothing happened. And then, you know, years later the Art Institute organized the exhibition, which is currently traveling now. And so I had a chance to write about some of those images. And I met Dawu Bey um, during that time of the 80s, and, and he asked me to write about his Harlem photographs. Eudora Welty, um, uh, just love her photographs of women, mm -hmm. and but the women workers, when we think about the women workers who are ignored, um, at, you know, they're, she captures them, she's following down the street on Saturday, she sees them in different locations, and she's documenting them. And, and just reimagining their lives outside of labor. Mm -hmm. And that's some of that. This is a new book that's coming out from Aperture um, by, of Kwame Brathwaite's work. Mm -hmm. And this is the cover image of, of his, yeah, of his wife, yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you think about beauty, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's been a central theme of my mind for a while because of that sense of denial of black beauty yes. was in that, and framing it and, and that's part of this. Um, and uh, Betty Saar asked me to write about her use of photographs. She wanted me to reflect about how she uses family images in her, in her artwork. And so I wrote for, uh, for her book there. Um, just to think about images and, and storytelling, and, and I was asked to write about one image in, in this book as well. Mm -hmm. And with Skip Gates and the image of the black and Western art, he asked me to look at the whole history of photography and, and look at different time periods. And he asked me to write two sections for one the, on the contemporary right, mm -hmm. and one for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, creating a postcard book, um, ICP created a vernacular photography collection and, mm -hmm. So these are just kind of the range of, of, of images. Um, this is a photographer in Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. um, that work. Gordon Park's new book, um, which is fascinating if you have a chance to see it, is the first 10 years of his life. Mm -hmm. And discovering photographs there, I would love to have talked to Gordon about that, which we never talked about. Sure. Because he lived in um, his first photographs in Minnesota, um, he worked uh, for a newspaper, a black newspaper there. He fought to have a byline, and, and the photographs are in in this um, collection, some of them from the newspapers, but it was just great to, to have these moments of, of Gordon. Yeah. Also with the whole aspect of Carla and writing about Sarah Bartman, known as the Hot and Top Venus, there were a number of women writing about that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, Carla and I invited um, a group of people to um, to write and share their their stories and research about about their own work within there. Mm -hmm. And then posing beauty was was central for me. It was kind of the culmination of the beginning of of picturing us and and to think about ways that we could look at beauty. And I think it started when so I was here at Duke, and I as soon as I left Duke. I got a job at NYU, and 
and, and diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And there were people who, when I was going through chemo and all of the horrific experience of cancer, that people didn't want to be around me because you know, I had a bald head, I didn't have yeah. eyebrows, I was, you know, looking like I had cancer to them. Sure. <laughs> but to me, I was like, I was living. Yes. And I thought it's really important to do something about how do we talk about, I wanted to do a book about etiquette and illness, things not to say, uh, you should uh -huh. never say. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then uh, I thought maybe I'll just flip it and just, just talk about how do we pose beauty in different ways. And then, uh, of course, having, um, you know, the bald head, beautiful mm -hmm. Susan Taylor on the cover, mm -hmm. it could it could be a reflection on, on how to think about beauty in that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from Plastic Bodies by Sheila to Carla and the Million Man March was central. Mm -hmm. The um, the Henry Gallery in, in Seattle invited me as an artist in resident for a semester and wanted me to go into their archives and look at the work and create something about that experience. Mm -hmm. And what I found was, as I think about old fashioned photography, so I put it out of fashion photography, which it, which means there are fashionable images, there are images of Native Americans, there are images about uh, beauty. So I wanted to figure out how we can embrace beauty. Mm -hmm. But beauty was still part of my moments yes. um, of, of telling the story. We invited again to create something on Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. And um, both Emily Bernard and I collaborated. She wrote on um, just the image of her, and I looked for all, a number of photographs of, of her to include in there. So these are moments from working with the National African American Museum mm -hmm. and to these different small nation of people. And moments like these were central for me. So from picturing us to now, we sort of get a kind of um, a snapshot of an evolving field through your experience. Uh, and picturing us, you, you remind us that uh, there was a time where a critic had to cross a picket line, essentially, to view Harlem on my mind, to see black images, despite um, a public outcry about the exhibition and the museum world. And picturing us gives us that moment in time and helps us move from then to now to see how much you've been able to do um, with photography as part of a sort of recuperative project of black history, if you will, mm -hmm. giving us other kinds of images to think through and critique. Um, and now we find ourselves in this present moment where you're able to do so much to institutionalize the field of black visual culture, mm -hmm. both with your center as well as with black portraitures. Um, can you say anything about the field as you see it today and as it relates to your work? Well, you know, I, it's, I, I, don't, I haven't thought about it in that way, mm -hmm. so it's, it's wonderful to see. When I read your website for this project, I said, "I want to do this. I want to do. I want to be a part of that project." Mm -hmm. But I, um, when created, when the provost invited me to 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 do the um, become the head of the Institute of African American Affairs, I said to her, "I really want to do something different. Mm -hmm. I want to create something on a visual culture, and and through the lens of black portraitures, mm -hmm. I want to think about." Um, how do we write about images? And I've met through the um, five odd years of, six years of creating black portraitures, so many younger scholars mm -hmm. um, who were writing about images and recycling some of the old stories, but new stories are developing. Mm -hmm. and, and they're visionaries. I think that that's mm -hmm. the next step. Mm -hmm. But we need to find a place for these voices. Sure. Um, people, um, like, I'm, it's nutty for me now. We had, we had about 300 proposals wow. set. Um, we couldn't take all of them, mm -hmm. but we. And then, of course, the 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 no can say no Deb created. Um, there are 50 panels. You know that in two days, so so for 25 days we're gonna have double panels. Everybody's gonna be in and out. 
And people are going to be mad because they can't go everywhere. But there's so many important voices for the upcoming, for the upcoming one that's going to be mm-hmm. in October. Mm-hmm. And and the same thing would happen in Boston. And the same thing would happen in South Africa. People paid their own way, but their work, they knew that their voices were really important. Um, and so I think that that's something I want to create something, not only as an archive, but also a place where people could, other people, other scholars can read images um, about, uh, read about images from the diaspora um, about um, about black people. And, and black portraiture mm-hmm. is one way of doing that mm-hmm. in, this, in the center. In the center, another, yes. Is another way. So I guess my last question, sort of thinking about, um, as I've, I realize I have asked you to think about this on the spot, you know, picturing us to now in a sort of retrospective of your work. But I wonder if there were sort of two things that you'd want us to understand about the field and about your work. What, what would those two things be? Um, Deb loves joy, mm-hmm. as you know, mm-hmm. that there, there's, there's something, um, there's some difficult moments in our lives that we can't ignore, but we need to find ways to tell stories about survival, about resistance, about resilience. And it's important for me, and I think the use of um, quilt making, this is a quilt that I use from Daddy's Ties, mm-hmm. but also to look at migration and slavery, um, to think what, what, how our memories are formed through experiences of, of the everyday lives, you know, from photographers who could photograph a couple um, on July 4th in the evening at, um, at, a, at a carousel and, and just seeing um, black joy in that way. To think about how um, Jacob Lawrence created the migration series and, and that aspect of it, to look at images that could reflect Obama from the joyful experiences to people who want to cry, create the sense of pride of, 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 of that, that experience. So I think that's where collaboration is a central way for me to continue working um, with intergenerational aspects of it. And that's something that I, I, I think is really central for me. But I hadn't thought about it, and I'm going to write that question down. And, try to answer that right (laughs) but we can end on black joy okay thank you thank you